Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. Open your word one more time. And I'm going to read where I would really, where my eyes would fall. And I believe it's going to be your will. You know what I did? I made sure I will not turn to the Old Testament again. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm talking something that really happens to the things that we do. Come on, young person, you laugh, that's right. But we do things like that because we are human. And God knows that, and that's why God works through us. So you know what I did? I, I kept my Bible like that, and I put my thumb towards the end of the Bible. So I'd really make sure I will not turn to Jeremiah 38 again. And I turned the Bible and I read, and this is what I read. I opened the Bible and I had opened the book of Acts. <laughs> when I saw the book, when I saw Acts, I knew I, I asked for this one too. <laughs> Acts 26, this is what I read. This is where my eyes fell and I read this. And when I read this, I was on my knees. I was seated there on the carpet. After the Lord uh, gave me Jeremiah, I went into praying. I was on my knees. And then after having prayed, I opened the Bible. Now here I am, picture myself on my knees in my bedroom praying. And then I open and I read this. Acts 26, 16. But rise and stand up upon thy feet. Man, I just put right up. <laughs> and it's real. God knows what we need. And you know, God tried everything else to get, me, to get through to me. And when he couldn't, he really came really down and really got through to me. And when he said, but rise and stand up on thy feet, without even thinking, I just stood up. It was automatic. Just, I just jumped to my feet. And I said, Ma. Then I, then I knew what I had done. I had stood up. And I began to read. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. My land. Now I send thee. Now I send thee. And I kept on reading, you know. I mean, I did not really understand what I was reading at that time because I just wanted to read on. Verse 18, inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. I'll tell you when I read that, I just about began to shake again. Rise and stand up on thy feet. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to send thee now. And now to you, this may not mean much, but to me it does because... When I read the part where it said, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. If you know anything about Sri Lanka or Buddhism or Hinduism, you will see how people in Sri Lanka, they hang on hooks. Yeah. Yeah. They hang themselves by hooks. Yeah. They pierce themselves. They would have metal objects going through their cheek. They would walk on hot coals. Yeah. They would beat themselves. Talk about darkness. And I knew that God was dealing with me. Hallelujah. To go to my people. I had a vision one day. I was praying at the altar on a Friday night in the church. I was there at the altar weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping. It was so heavy, so hard for me to bring anything out, so hard to express myself. I was just weeping and weeping. And then I had my eyes closed. I was praying there for about two hours at the altar. I, I, I prayed to God that we would stay long enough to hear God speak to us. We come to the altar today, you know, uh, we go to the altar, we stay for five, ten minutes, nothing happens, we are ready to go, ready to leave. 
I was there for two hours. I was praying. I had my eyes closed and my hands raised up. And I remember tears were coming down my cheeks with my eyes closed. And I saw some faces. That was the first vision I ever seen in my life. And there were faces of people, just the faces, just this part of the body. That's all. Above the neck. And all the faces, they, their faces, the chins were tilted up. Like that. And every one of them had a pleading look in their eyes. And some of the faces that I saw were faces of friends, my best of friends that I knew from Sri Lanka. And others I had never seen and never known. I knew God was dealing with me. To make a long story short, we made application and you know we were appointed and we went to Sri Lanka. And when I, I'll tell you that, when I went, there was a heavy load that lifted off me. Right. I had more victory in my life, in my everyday walk with God, when the burden, when the load lifted me. And God took that burden. And we went to Sri Lanka in 1983 to start our first term. Rookies don't know much about it. Though I am from the country, did not know anything about missionary work. I had to learn. And there were no missionaries in the country to help me or teach me. I am the first missionary that went back after 25 years. From 58 to 83, 25 years. So I had to learn by making my own mistakes. And I always tried to contact the missionaries whom I knew from the other fields or back home in St. Louis and tried to get some input advice. We went there on the 7th of July, 1983. Now I have finished the part about ready to go. Now I'm going to come to you. Are you ready to stay? It's one thing that we are ready to go. It's another that we are ready to stay. Like Sister Freeman said about this young man on the AIM program. His preconceived ideas. So we arrived there on the 7th of July, 1983, and we didn't have a place to live. So I contacted my sister, and she gave us one bedroom, a tiny little room, for myself, for my wife, and my 18-month-old daughter. No air condition, nothing, you know, just a little bedroom and tell you uh, it was something. But we stayed there. And two weeks after we arrived there in the country, the civil war broke out. Have you been reading about the civil war of Sri Lanka? It broke out just two weeks after we arrived there. In the history of Sri Lanka, we've never had a civil war. And what do you think, why do you think is there a civil war now, just two weeks after a UPC missionary comes into the country after 25 years? And the war broke out and the government slammed the curfew. Because the mobs were going on the streets, they were killing, they were looting, they were raping, they were burning factories, they were burning buildings. And I came out of my sister's home, bedroom, and I looked across and there were at least three factories going up in smoke. And they slammed a curfew, a 24-hour, three-day curfew. For three days, nobody was permitted to be on the streets. Anybody that was seen on the streets of Sri Lanka, the forces had the permission to shoot them on sight. And here I am, just two weeks in the country, just raw, and don't know what to do. And you know, you live in a little bedroom with your sister and you can't ask too much from them. You don't want to, you know, impose on people. And there we are, and of course they try to do their best for us. And my little girl was crying for milk, crying for juice, wanting this, wanting that, and I could not go to the store. All the stores were closed and nobody could go on the street. I, was, I felt so frustrated. You know, is that something, you know, we know why we are there, but a little girl does not understand. An 18-month-old girl does not know why we are there. 
And when a child looks at you and cries and asks you for things, the basic thing the child needs to survive, and you can get it. Even if you had the money, you just can't get it. You will be blown to pieces if you go on the street. Frustrating, my friend. So after the three-day curfew was over, they, they relaxed the curfew for about six hours during the day. So people can go out and buy their groceries and what, do whatever they have to do and get back home and they'll start the curfew again. And when the six hours came, you know what I did? The first place I told my wife, I said, I'm going, honey. I'll try to pick up some food and I'm going to the telephone office, downtown Colombo, and I'm going to call St. Louis. And I told my wife what I was going to tell them. I was going to tell St. Louis, Brother Sissom, Brother Jard, Brother Lehman, Brother Rodenbush, or anybody that I could get a hold of, I was going to ask them permission to leave Sri Lanka. Ready to go? Ready to stay? I told my wife, I'll, I'll talk to them and I'll ask them permission. I'll tell them the situation. It is very dangerous. Our lives are threatened. My, my wife is a foreigner and I could somehow escape, manage or do whatever. And uh, I, was, I was afraid. Fear of the unknown. So I told her, I'll call them and ask them permission to come back to Canada. If not, to give me permission to go to Pakistan or Singapore and stay there for a while until things come, calms down. You know what? It's been five years. The civil war is still going on. It, has, it hasn't calmed down yet. The last five years, 8,000 people have been killed by time bombs, etc., on two occasions, I came close to being shot, killed. Not because of anything. I just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. That's all it takes. And when I went to the... I, I, I had a friend of mine, a Buddhist, a best friend, a friend that I told you I saw in the vision. I saw his face in the vision. And he drove me. I had no vehicle. I just got to the country. It took me about three months to get my Chief of Christ vehicle because... You know, in Sri Lanka, it takes time to get things done. You just can't walk in and get a car. You were so right in what you said. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I had to rent a little van, and uh, my friend drove me downtown, and we parked the vehicle downtown, not too far from the telephone office, and he and I, we got off the vehicle, and we were walking towards the office to call St. Louis. I took a few feet towards the office and the shooting broke out right in the middle of it. I was ready to go. Now I was ready to come back. God got through to me to go. Now I felt it's time for me to come back. The shooting broke out because the terrorist they had planted a time bomb and the time bomb went off and the forces came in there and there was a crossfire and I was right in the middle of it and I had, I didn't know what to do. Talk about frustration, talk about chaos, I just ran. I just ran. I got in the vehicle, I told my friend, I said, get me out of here, get me out of here. You know why? Because I was out of the will of God to be there in the first place. I'll tell you something, my friend. You know what? God did not put me in that place. place. I put myself in that telephone office. I put my... You know what? There are two kinds of storms, my friend. There is a God-sent storm and there is a man-made storm. You go into a God-sent storm, God will take care of it. Because God, Jesus told the disciples, He constrained them to go to the other side. Why did he constrain them? Because they were fishermen. They knew the waters. They knew the sea. They knew the clouds very well. Yet Jesus constrained them to go. And when he constrained them to go and they went, when the storm came, he rescued them because it was his will that they went into the storm. But if you get into a storm that is man-made, you better get out of it, my friend. But if you get into a storm that is God sent, God will get you out of it. 
And I ran, I just ran because I knew I was in the wrong place. I was not in the will of God by trying to call St. Louis and get out of the country. After 25 years, God performs a miracle, Sister Freeman, Brother Freeman, and God opens the door, and here I am trying to get out. And I ran, I tell you, we live about seven miles from downtown, seven miles. It took us five hours to drive seven miles. There was chaos, pandemonium broke out. Every intersection, they would stop our vehicle. They would want gasoline from my vehicle to burn people alive. I counted six bodies I had to cross over that were burned alive. There was a man, they skinned him alive. When I saw that, I was so frustrated. I did not know what to do. I did not want to stay there. I did not want to stay there. ready to go you better be ready to stay oh, yeah. and we came back somehow I got back home you know for five hours I couldn't get back home and my you know the devil works right there like sister Freeman said the devil really works right here you know what went through my mind I could see my wife and my daughter in flames Whew. I tried to get home seven miles took me five hours I couldn't get home. Finally, I got home, and there they were. And my brother had come home, and his shirt was bloody. He had been in a bus trying to beat the curfew back home, and there was a stabbing in the bus, and the blood has gushed over onto his clothes. And when I saw that, I thought somebody had stabbed my brother. I was ready to quit. I went into my bedroom. I began to just feel sorry for myself. I knew very well that God called me. I knew that. But yet, here I was trying to find an excuse to get out of it. And I knelt down and I began to just weep and weep and weep. I didn't pray. I just was feeling sorry for myself. And my friend, when I felt sorry for myself, I really felt rotten. The more you feel sorry for yourself, the more rotten you are going to feel. That's the trick of the devil. And I was there. And finally, I knew I was getting myself in a worse mess. I was going down and down. And I knew I had to come out of it. And somehow, I believed there were people. I have proof of that. There were people in this country that were praying for me. A young man walked into my booth at the general conference in Oklahoma City. He said, you are missionary Matthias? I said, yes, sir. He told me his name. I shook hands. He said, listen, I want to tell you something. I said, yes. He said, I've just been in the church about five years. I said, huh? I said, what do you want to tell me? He said, when I got in the church, about a year after I got in the church, he told me this. He said, missionary, I have never heard the name Prince Matthias. I never knew that there was a man by that name. He was in prayer. And the Spirit of God moved on that man, and he called the name Prince Matthias to pray for. It happened. He had never heard my name. He never knew there is a man by that name. Never ever knew a man existed like that. He prayed for me, and then later it was so heavy, the burden was so great, he went to his pastor, and he told his pastor, Pastor, I just can't get away from praying for Prince Matthias. He said, what is Prince Matthias? And the pastor said, I don't know. And the pastor kept on looking and he said, hey, we have a missionary. Here's, here's his photo on the map by the name of Prince Matthias. There's power in the spirit, Brother Garrison. Yeah. <laughs> and I asked him when it happened. He told me the time it happened. It was the time I was going through my trial, my friend. If God calls you, God will provide a way for you to stay and do His will. That's why you better make sure you do the will of God. If it is the will of God, don't you worry, my friend. No hell or no devil's hell can stop you. And finally, when I overcame my self-pity, I opened the Bible at random again. And I open it to Psalm 91. Okay. Now you go home and read Psalm 91. Right. <laughs> when I read that, I jumped out of my feet. I went to my living room. I said to my sister's living room, I said, honey, we are going to stay here. She said, we are. I said, yes, we are. 
I said, there's going to be a revival. The devil is mad. God has called us and we will stay. You know why? God got through to me about going and God got through to me about staying. Ready to go. Ready to stay. The revival broke out the last four years. The Lord helped us and we baptized about 1,200 people in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. It's not much. We are expecting God for greater things this second term. Today we have 14 churches and 20 preaching points and 20 licensed preachers in the last four years. God is great. God calls, my friend. God provides. God guides. And of the revival that broke out, it broke out through the Trinitarians. The Trinitarians opposed me. I was accused to be a CIA agent and all that nonsense. We baptized seven Trinitarian Pentecostal preachers, pastors in Jesus' name. Baptized three Buddhist monks. Sri Lanka is a Buddhist country and you don't touch a Buddhist. That is why our missionaries were asked to leave. We did not only baptize Buddhist people, but the Lord helped us and we baptized three Buddhist priests in Jesus' name. Ready to go, ready to stay. The Lord bless you. Jesus, one more time. We love you. We pray. We thank you. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, Lord. Jesus. Oh, God. There is a clear sound that comes from your spirit today. Lord. today and we hear you. Lord God, we magnify your name. Hallelujah. 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 Let he that hath a near hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. I really hear the voice of the Lord speaking to me right now. And I hope that you can be sensitive enough to him to hear what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is, don't say it's going to be four months and then comes the harvest. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They're already quiet. I believe the Lord would baptize us with an understanding today of the urgency of the hour that we're living in. Although we have heard and been ministered to by the Spirit of God from the Word of the Lord from each of these great men and women of God, they have dropped things in our mind, and if we're not careful, we'll push them so far into the future that before we ever reach to pick them up again, they will have eluded us and been gone somewhere else. But I really believe that today the Lord wants us to be busy. Amen. Open your Bible with me to 11th chapter of St. Luke. You can kind of hold your finger there for just a minute in that particular chapter. I have not come here today to appeal to your intellect. I am here joining these forces of men and women of God and, of course, your leaders in this great Bible college. The reason all of us are here today is because outside the walls of this building is a lost and dying world. It is not God Almighty and it is not Jesus Christ that has divided this world up geographically, but it's our own mind that have put Asia in its place and Africa in its place and New York in its place and Texas in its place. But to God, it's all the world. Outside the walls of this building's a dying world. They're lost. They need Jesus Christ. If they ever will see the light of this precious gospel, the people who know it and have had it in their own life are going to be the people to share it with them. And may we understand something in God today that we would not get caught up in geographical locations and we would buy time that would be the enemy of our soul. But let us be conscious that while we're standing here sane and in our right minds today, there is a call of God. 
There is a will of God. There is a desire. There's a hunger. And it's been placed there because we have been placed here. And the world is waiting on us. We must respond. Before I read my scripture to you this morning, I'd like for you young men to turn around and lay hands on someone near you. You young ladies, lay hands on someone near you. We're going to be talking about ministering in the power of the Spirit. And the Spirit must go far beyond our intellect and our knowledge. We need to be in touch with the Holy One of Israel right now. That God could make all of this make sense and it would have a purpose and a meaning in our lives. We need to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. in us right now, Lord, that cannot be quenched, holy by the voice of your Spirit. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Release something in us today, O oh Lord. Minister in your power by your Spirit, by your great word that is forever settled. Oh, open the door with your spirit, O oh Lord. Let us be in oneness with your spirit, O oh God. Put something in us that sh cannot be moved, Lord. Put something in us, O oh God, that will establish your truth in the hearts of the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that outside the walls of this building today are nations, there are cities, there are tribes of people, there are numbers, great numbers of people that's waiting on us to respond to the voice of God and the Spirit of God. We have a call of God on our life. We're in the will of God today. We must allow God to put it so deep in us that we would respond and do what He needs to do in our own life. I pray that before he finishes with us this morning that we will come into a oneness with him. That it would not just be another mission seminar, not just be another class, but it would be a relationship with God Almighty. That whenever we walk out of these doors that we would not look at four months or one year or four years into the future, but we'd be looking for that lost soul that we're going to meet today before we go to our bed to sleep tonight. And to Jesus Christ, it is the world. Yeah. Yeah. And it's outside these walls. Hear what the Spirit has to say unto the church. 11th chapter of the book of St. Luke, verse 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against itself, a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub, and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is coming to, upon you. When a strong man is armed, he keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him 
all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me. May I say that to you again? He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. I hope that is plain enough for you to understand what Jesus Christ was saying to them and also saying to us today. He knows our thoughts. He knows what we have need of. And what we need to understand right now more than anything else in the world is if we're not 100% for God, we are against Him. If you're 99 and one here that has the Holy Ghost, had the devil living in you before God came and cleaned you out. But what maybe you don't realize today is that devil that came out of you ever so long ago, or if it was yesterday, that same demonic power from hell is still camped at your doorstep today. He'll go to work with you when you leave here to go to work this morning. He'll follow you through your activities today. He'll be in your bedroom when you go to sleep. Go through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. I will return unto my house from whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. God bless you. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Bible colleges are absolutely necessary. Studying the word of God, it's impossible to live in this world for God without a knowledge of his word. But we need the Spirit of God and the Spirit of His Word to make it alive in us that we would be able to fulfill what we have been commissioned to do. I believe that the church is uh, at a point today that we are awakening to an awareness in the Spirit that what has been in the past is not going to be able to carry us on the journey we must take in the future. We must be aware that the God that designed this thing is still in charge of it and in control of it. We must also be aware that even though we are in the flesh and we are doing the works of the flesh and we are in a battle with the flesh and of all things, today is a fast day and we are struggling against the will and the desire of the flesh. We know what it is. And that is where the battle is fought and won and that's where the victory is, is won also. But today we stand before God Almighty, still struggling with this flesh, but there is a spirit world that's just as real as that flesh that you live in. And that spirit world we must be conscious of because there are demons out there that have come to destroy, they have come to paralyze you, they have come to rob and steal from you, and to take everything that God has intended for you and for you to use in his kingdom. The devil intends to rob you of that and leave you powerless that you'll just float on through life until it's over. And there's going to be a multitude of people in hell because you did not respond and go to where they are to preach the gospel to them. And I believe if there has ever been an onslaught against the church, it's today and it's by the spirit of the enemy of our soul. One thing we fail to realize is while we are living and existing in Pentecost, that we are partakers of a spirit world and we are fighting that battle right there today and something needs to become conscious of us that we would know what we need to do now in order to defeat the devil, not let him ravish us and take advantage of us, but we need to take advantage of him. I am possessed with an urgency today that there's a world lost and I must do my part to reach them, whether it's in Africa or China or Asia or Texas or my relative or my brother or my son or my wife, whoever it is, if they're lost and they're on the way to hell, I owe them what Jesus Christ has given me. The unclean spirit went out. I am free from that. The spirit of God is inside of me, but those demons are still lurking there and they are trying to make an entrance. They want me to go back to where I was when Jesus found me. And they will torment us and torture us and sing songs to us until we would receive them back again. But what really happens is after we have fought until we're weary and we have struggled until we feel like there's no more struggling and we want to give up, we invite that same spirit back into us. But the problem is he comes back, but he don't come alone. You may choose that spirit that has been tormenting you and wrestling with you for such a long time. But whenever he is allowed to come in, he's going to go and choose seven others. 
To you it may just be a little lie or it may be just a little fornication or a little adultery or just a little lust or something of that nature when it begins, when you begin to turn your mind against the will of God. But when the devil gets all of his companions and start moving in, it may be just a little bit more than that. And the last state of the man is worse than it was in the beginning. And what I'm saying to you is it's very dangerous to live a lukewarm life. It's very dangerous to ride the fence. Maybe our forefathers have done it and been successful in doing it. But where we are living today in the kingdom of God, we cannot do it. We're standing closer to the rapture of the church than anybody that's ever lived. The coming of the Lord's closer to us than anyone. And we must be overcome by the spirit that is speaking to the church today. Do you know why the United Pentecostal Church or the body of Christ is on its knees? Because God needs our undivided attention. He wants to bring us to a knowledge that he's coming back after a people that's looking for him. Not looking to elements in this world, not being involved in things of this life, but our mind is constantly and totally focused on him. And if we have our mind on Jesus Christ, we're going to know one thing, that we are going to be possessed with a desire to do his will, to reach the lost. And we will not be caught up in all of these little side streets of it hurts, it's uncomfortable, it costs too much, it's too painful, I don't like it there, but we will be possessed with something that we would look at it and say, no matter what's going to happen out there today or tomorrow, I'm sold out to Jesus Christ, I'm going to live for him, I'm going to live with him, I'm going to let him do what needs to be done in the spirit in my life so I can reach the world that I'm living in. We are in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans in the spirit world today. Our world's dying, it's lost, God's trying to get our attention so we might do what he started so many thousands of years ago. We have been sidetracked by the glories of Pentecost and we're still stammering around with stammering lips and staggering under the intoxication of the Holy Ghost and patting each other on the back of all the experiences of the glory world that we're sharing together. But we have stopped, have failed to realize that while we are enjoying this beautiful experience of Pentecost, there's still a dying world outside that's lost. And sometimes it don't bother us until we look into the, the, the face of our mother or our brother or our relative that just come down with incurable cancer and we don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden we realize the seriousness of prayer. We realize the seriousness of a spiritual battle. We realize the seriousness of getting in there where the rubber meets the road and doing something to move God so God can move the devil so there can be a miracle to save my mother or my sister or my brother. If we were where the... The church needs to be today. We would not be so oppressed by the devil. But we would put him in his place. I think what's happening to us is we are physically and mentally trying to operate the will of God and the work of God. And we're doing a pretty good job because we have picked up a lot of things along the way in the spirit and in the word that's helped us to keep our head above the water. But I really believe for us to be successful in this last and closing hour of time, we're, have going, we're going to have to be connected to something that's greater than we are. Yeah. We do not need a friendship. We need a relationship. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We do not need just another prayer meeting. We need a rendezvous with Jesus Christ and stay there with him continually. And I honestly believe this. Whenever we fall in love with him and get into the spirit of his kingdom... That no matter what anybody does or says, whether it is for us or against us, it will never affect us. You have listened to men and women here today that have given themselves in a foreign field and, and walked in so many dangerous positions in life. And they have been there with Jesus Christ and Jesus has made the difference in their life. When you're looking at the, at the gun facing you and know that there's death on the other side of it. You forget about all you own and you forget about all of the things that were important in life. And you are face to face with life or death. And if God's with you, you'll live. But if you've missed it somewhere, friend, it won't be long until they'll be sending flowers to your gravesite. So I think it's very important that we get a hold of what's happening today in the spirit. Even though we're yet in the flesh, there must be something take place in us. To be able to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit and let God work with us on the foreign field or even here at home, I believe there's some basic things that we need not overlook. And Sister Freeman's mother said it, and I heard it through the grapevine. I thought it was so fitting and so true. And if we could get a hold of this and let it be a foundation for our life, then a whole lot of things will change in our life. They were ta starting the Quest program. In actual reality, what we were trying to do is find out from God how to have a move of His Spirit to save the world we're living in. 
and get us out of the dilemma that we're in. But uh, Sister Freeman's mother sent a message to Brother Urshan through her son Jerry and told him to tell Brother Urshan, you can call it quest, you can call it anything you want to. You can try to, you know, dramatize it or put an attachment to it and attach it to a committee to try to find out how to have a move of God and how to have end time revival. But the only way you're all ever going to have it is a way that's always worked since the beginning, and that's praying and fasting. And whenever we get those basic elements in our life, praying and fasting, oh, yeah. seeking God, it's going to happen. Regardless, God's just going to make it happen. And we can hear all of these beautiful stories and we can get caught up in it and dream about being a missionary or dream about going somewhere and doing a work for God. But we'll never do anything there until we start doing something right here. You can live your life dreaming until 60 years has gone by and it's too late to go and the nation or the country or the people that you were called to go to are already dead and in their grave and will be somewhere in hell in eternity and you have just been messing around wondering how it's going to be when you get over yonder. But what's really going to affect the over yonder is what's affecting us right here today. Right. Letting it get a hold of us. Forget about all of the veneer and the facade and just getting right down to where the rubber meets the road and realize that if we ever have a move of God, if we ever reach a people that's on its way to hell, we're going to have to be moved by His Spirit. We're going to have to be overcome and possessed by His Spirit. It's got to be a driving force daily in our life. We cannot be caught off on some side street somewhere. But when we wake up in the morning, it's going to be Jesus. What are we going to do today? And we're going to walk with Him all day long. And we're going to give Priya His voice authority over our life that if he says go we go if he says stop we stop if he says wait we wait and we really won't care what anybody else says about it we really won't care about how it affects all of everybody else in our world but what we're really sincere and honest about is I want to win somebody to God I want to save somebody that's on their way to hell and whatever you have to do through me and to me Jesus to let it happen I want it to happen to me Amen. and I believe when we receive the Holy Ghost that the Lord blessed us with something that will help us to fulfill what he has called us to do and uh, somehow if God could help us today to understand our position in the spirit world I said it's in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans let me read for you beginning with verse number 22 for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now and not only they but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Verse 24, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? All right. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. I want you to notice verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit maketh intercession for the saints. According to the will of God. If we are willing today to do the will of God. And we will release what God put in us by his spirit. Then that spirit that is in us is going to do a work in us and through us. That will reach the world that we're living in. But I think that we have sidestep the real truth by enjoying what God has given to us rather than putting it to use to its fullest extent what it was really designed for speaking in tongues as a sign of you receiving the presence of God is not the end of it that's only the beginning of it that is a weapon that is a power tool that God has given to us that we can use in the spirit and we can be able to break down the barriers of the spirit world that is opposing truth. Just as sure as we're in this building today, 
There are angels of God and there are demons of hell that's in this building. Just as sure as we are inside and outside, there are also these spirits and these powers. And they are ruling nations. They are ruling cities. They are ruling peoples. The spirit of the devil has set up his kingdom. And it's we who have the name of Jesus Christ and have the spirit of God Almighty that would release what God has put in us. And if we'll open the door of it and let it begin to do its work through us, then we are going to be in heavy combat in the spirit world. And we're going to call angels to come and assist us. And we're going to see the barriers broken down. We're going to see nations come to Jesus Christ. But what we need to understand is our link in the spirit world and how to allow the spirit to make intercession for us and how to join ourselves with it and allow it to begin to form something in us. It's more than just talking in tongues and the knowledge and saying, hey, I've got it. God's with me. I've got the Holy Ghost. If the rapture takes place, I'm ready to go. But it has been designed in us that we might use this and let it use us to join together in a unity with God that it will actually cause the spirit world to come to an awareness and attention that they are actually being commanded to do something. A lot of folks get nervous when you start talking about angels and demons, but they're real. They are real, and they are very important. And not only has there been an awareness in the Spirit of God in the mind of the church today, these 6 o'clock prayer meetings have brought us to a relationship with Jesus Christ and we're finally feeling the throb of God's heart and we picking up on what He really wants us to do. And in this awareness of the Spirit, He has begun to break down some of the physical things that we have used as our own equipment to do the will of God. These things have served their purpose, but I feel like today that it's time for us to lay aside these things and plunge deep into the things of the Spirit of God and let God's power through His Spirit do the work that needs to be done. One man anointed by the power of God, sensitive to the voice of God, walking in the Spirit of God and commissioning the angelic forces that have been sent with him to go into a dark world, will be able to break down barriers that mentally and physically and intelligently we have not been able to touch for hundreds of years. These demons have had their kingdom set up in these countries and in our cities for thousands upon thousands of years. They know more about this spiritual warfare than we'll ever hope to know. We can study it from Genesis to Revelation. We can pray and seek God to try to understand it. But there is always going to be that unknown factor that we have to live in and we have to deal with. And that is where our faith grows in Jesus Christ. That is where our knowledge and our relationship grows in Him. That we go as far as we can go and then all of a sudden we turn loose and then we begin to flow into that unknown world of the spirit and all of a sudden he begins to speak and he begins to allow his word to come into us and we walk where he says walk and we do what he says do and then we stand back and behold the glory of God five minutes of God's moving spirit in this building today will change nations What we have done to soothe the pain and nurse the pain in 30 seconds, God can totally remove it and remove the symptoms and remove the problems. We physically try to put up with it and join with it and try to minister to it. But whenever we get loose in the spirit of God, God's mentality, God's wisdom makes it all so more clear that we can be able to see what he really wants to do. But it can only come when we come to the age of ourselves and then we plunge ourselves into that stream of God's beauty. And I find it here. I learned this a long time ago. I'm not telling you something I heard. I'm telling you something today I know. And I tell stories about myself because I know more about me than I do anyone else. But I came to grips with this a long time ago that there's more to it than just preaching a sermon and going through religious activities and going through the, the methods that have been given to us to try to reach our world. There has to be something inside that begins to pour out of us that reaches down in the heart of that center that locks onto them like vice grips and pulls them into that relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not just another track or another church invitation, but it's a contact by the spirit world. And God has given us equipment in the spirit world. If we would use it, it would be very powerful for us in the last day that we're living in. One man can do the work of a thousand men. 
if we stand in the spirit of God. Brother and sister Freeman have left tracks all over that great continent of Africa. Every devil, every demon that's ever come out of hell and launched and set up on the throne of a nation or a city or a village or any form of hierarchy in the spirit world knows when these people come walking down the road, when they get off the plane, there is a tremor in the spirit world because of what they have seen and what they have allowed God to do through them. It's not unusual for the devil to come up and speak, not even been able to speak the English language, begin to speak very clear. I know who you are, E.L. Freeman. Why? Because somewhere when we begin to lock out our mentality and begin to flow into the deep things of the Spirit of God, there was a release and a trust in God that we just knew that God knows what's going on out there and we have released ourselves to it and He's going to take care of it. I find in my own self in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans that the Spirit of God that He has placed in me when I go as far as I can go mentally, whenever I stop there and allow the Spirit of God to break through in me and begin to pray in tongues. Have you ever prayed in tongues? And got past that understanding that, hey, I've got the Holy Ghost. But there is a mentality that comes to you that you feel something working in you. You feel something walking around outside of you. You feel channels closed off in your mentality, but you feel channels open up in the spirit. And there is a growth, and there is a steadfastness, and there is a release of faith. And there are wars going on in the spirit, and there are barriers being broken down, and things are happening that we are not mentally conscious of. But something in our spirit tells us that everything is going to be all right. Now, I went to a church one time some years ago to preach for a pastor that needed a revival, and I didn't know it until I got there that the spirits that were within that church were just horrendous. And that man had fasted and prayed and shut himself up in his Sunday school room for weeks without water and food, trying to find the mind of God, not knowing that the people on the pew were some of the biggest devils in Pentecost, chewing on him behind his back, looking him in his face and telling him, oh, you're a great man, but then just among themselves. And I wasn't there any time until I picked up that spirit and I thought, no, Lord, what in the world am I going to do with this? This is my friend. I'm here to help him. I don't even have the, the nerve to tell him what I feel here. He loves these people. He's pouring himself out for these people. How can I tell him what I sense in the Holy Ghost? And so I made up my mind. I was going to forget about all of them and I was going to find anybody that was hungry for God. There was about three of them. And I told him, I said, y'all come tomorrow and we're going to get together and pray. And we got together and prayed and I told him, I said, we're going to get in the spirit. The Lord's going to take us on a little trip. And we're going to get in the spirit world and God's going to start doing things. And I schooled them a little bit and they got to praying. They got to praying in tongues. And we just spent hours just talking in tongues, walking around crying. And the spirit of the thing got a hold of us. And before it was over, God revealed all of the things that were there and opened it up. Revival broke out. The people that were there were given trouble, left. And, and the church is still there. It's a revival church today. But before I knew what happened... After we had prayed one day, I stood up and I told him in the service that night, I said, some of you have said that this man on this pulpit is not the man of God for this place. I said, God's going to prove to you that this is the man for the job because before Sunday morning comes in this church, a brand new person that's never been in this church before is going to pray through the Holy Ghost. And when that happens, God's going to tell you that this is the man for this hour. Wouldn't you know every night we come to church, there was not one visitor that arrived all week long. But then Saturday afternoon, we got out in the Kmart parking lot. We was going to have church, passing out tracts. And I was standing there, and there were some little girls that was handing out tracts. And one of them walked right up to the door where people were coming out. And uh, <clears throat> I happened to be looking at her when she was handing tracts to these people. She reached up at a lady. She walked out the door. And just as she walked out the door, that lady just pushed that child out of the way and started across the parking lot. And when I saw this, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, that lady just passed up her last opportunity to go to heaven. And I was so consumed with this. Before I knew what I was doing, I was running across the parking lot to try to stop that lady and tell her what the Lord had told me. She made it to her car before I arrived, and I didn't know what to do. Really, I didn't know what I was going to say, but the fact that I just had to tell her something. And I ran up there, and just as I got there, she shut the door on me. And she looked up at me, and she said, what do you want? And I said, lady, I want to talk to you for just a minute. She said, get out of my way. I'm in a hurry. Her little girl was in the front seat. She jumped out of the car and said, wait a minute, Mom. I left something in the store. And she ran off. Then the lady turned around and looked at me and said, well, what do you want? And I said, lady, please, I have a message for you. And she kind of grit her teeth and got a hold of the steering wheel. And I said, God wants to help you. Sure. They were singing, worshiping the Lord out there, some of the young people. 
I told her, I said, it's not right for you to be miserable. You can be happy. And she stuck, looked at me and tears started running in her cheeks. She said, I am miserable and I would like to be happy. She told me a story. I'm not going to tell it all to you, but the essence of it was she was raised in the nominal church, lived for God, married a man, and they lived for God for some years. Then he backslid and went out and turned out to be an alcoholic and he got his brains blown out in the bar and she was left at home alone with all of her children. She just was in a miserable state, out of church, out of contact with God, struggling, trying to make ends meet and, and on welfare and one thing after another. And this particular day, so miserable that she didn't know what to do, walked into the presence of God. And she was weeping when she told me the story. And I said, lady, you don't have to be miserable any longer. You see those people out there that's singing the joy of the Lord on them? I said, the Lord can give you just exactly what they have. She turned around to me and she said, I would love to have that. And I said, all you have to do is repent and God will give you the Holy Ghost. And she started repenting and tears ran down her face. God filled with the Holy Ghost right there in the car in the Kmart parking lot. She started speaking in tongues and there was two black ladies that walked up. I guess they thought I was going to rob the lady or molest her or something. They was just there to kind of to be eyewitnesses. But when this lady started speaking in tongues, the Holy Ghost shot by me and hit both those ladies and both of them received the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Sunday morning, they were in church and those old reprobates' mouths were hanging open because they were looking to say, he is the man of God for our church. <laughs> but God knew all of this, you see, and the only way that we could understand it is get in the vein of the Holy Ghost and really understand what was going on. Not only can we pick up on him in the spirit and he will begin to real th reveal things that we have no knowledge of, but in the spirit world, he's given us things that we can use for our own benefit. I believe that angels are ministering spirits. They're here. I can use them. I can command them. I can send them to go before me. They can open doors. They can shut doors. They can bind people. They can throw them out of my way so I can do what God is telling me to do. They're mine. They're to my, at my disposal. And when I get in the spirit of God, I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost. In my own mind, I'm not conscious of what's going on, but in the spirit, there's an intercession being made for me. I'm not knowledgeable of what's waiting on me out there, but God knows what's out there. He knows what the enemy has been planted. He knows where his stronghold is. But when I begin to release myself to him, he will take a hold of me and use what I have been given to command angels of God. I made a statement one Sunday morning and I told them we were going to have a prayer meeting in our church. It would last from Easter to Pentecost. Seven weeks. We're not going to break it. The prayer chain's on the door. Everybody sign up an hour prayer shifts. Come to the church. We're not going to break it for seven weeks. I said, y'all sign up first. What's left? I'll take it. And I was surprised when I went there Sunday after church and looked that everybody signed up 8 o'clock in the morning and 12 o'clock midnight. From 12 midnight to 8 o'clock in the morning, nobody's signature was there. And I made the statement that they would not be broken no matter what had to happen if I had to stay at the church. And I didn't know I was going to have to spend the night at the church for seven weeks all night long from 12 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the morning to keep the prayer chain. But I meant it because I really believed it. The first night I went, I went home and drank some coffee and came back 12 o'clock and I started to pray in about 15 minutes. I'd pray for everything I could think of. <laughs> and everybody I knew. And I thought, Lord, I'll never make it to daylight. But then the spirit of prayer came on me and I started oh, to pray. And you know what happened? Before I knew it, it was 8 o'clock. Every night, the same thing. Anxious to go to church. Couldn't wait to get there. For eight hours every night, a relationship with the Lord. But your body gets weary sometimes and you kind of get wrung out. And I don't know how far into this thing I was, but I was burning the candle on both ends. And I was so tired. And I'd bring coffee and I'd drink it to stay awake. And, and I was walking around and I was beating myself in the face because I didn't want to break the prayer chain. And then I just felt like if somebody would come and help me pray, I can make it through the daylight. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, well, whatever you ask for is what you get. So I told the Lord, I said, send the angel of God to go and wake one of my men up and bring him here and let him help me pray the rest of the night. Hallelujah. And I prayed that way and I really forgot. I got busy trying to stay awake and keep the prayer chain going and then all of a sudden came a knock on the door and it terrified me and I went to the door and in my mind I thought, well, and the Lord sent one of my deacons and one of my elders and went to the door and opened it up and there was a sinner man standing on the church porch and he was crying he was shaking he said, Brother Garrison, he said, I don't know what's wrong with me. He said, I worked all day long today. I was so tired when I got home. I ate my supper and I went straight to bed. And I wanted to kind of get rested up before I had to hit it again tomorrow. But he said, all of a sudden, right out of the midst of a dead sleep, he said, a voice shook me and woke me up and said, get up and go to the church right now. Brother Garrison needs you. And he said, I don't know what you want, but he said, please tell me. He came in the church before the sun rose that morning. He had the Holy Ghost and we had a prayer meeting. But these things are available to us. They are power in our life if we will allow them to be there. 
they're accessible to us if we would understand that angels are actually there to be commanded and commissioned to go. Mr. Freeman, I think, was talking about the women's conference, and there was ladies strewn all over the place, laying on the ground, shouting and hooping and hollering from upstairs down the steps, out laying in the grass, rolling like real holy rollers all out over that acreage, praising God. But did you know one night they stood up, and all the women who did not have husbands in the church, they stood, and they began to pray. And you know what they did? They began to bind the devil, and they commissioned angels to go where their sinner husbands were right at that particular moment and break down barriers and open doors. And you know what happens? They are bound by spirit of the enemy that's around them they really want to live for God but they're so confused they don't know which way's up but we have the power to bind the enemy we have the power to send the angel of God there and defeat the enemy so that when the devil's leaving them alone they can think clearly and understand what God wants them to know they prayed did you know before they closed that women's conference that telephone calls came in from all over the country drug addicts walking in off the street his wife was at the meeting. But when it was all finished, he went and found somebody at the church and they came and prayed him through the Holy Ghost. All over the...